do not judge are easily three of the most misquoted words of the entire Bible. Nobody ever reads the full passage from which they come or delves into their meaning. These three words are just simply taken as a blanket statement, which, mean, which means that you should not judge any behaviors whatsoever as right or wrong. There is no right or wrong. You should not question anything that anybody else is doing uh, because that would be judging. You should just allow anything to go, anything goes, let people destroy themselves, have a good time. Everybody just have a good time. No moral spine whatsoever, just turtle up, do nothing. But isn't that what Jesus was saying when he uttered these words in Matthew 7? <laughs> Are we commanded to become enablers of sin and withhold the truth from those whom we claim to love? When I was in prison, ah, see? You judged me right there, didn't you, you hypocrite, you judgmental sinner, you! Shame on you! <laughs> but no, I've never actually been to prison as an inmate. I was there uh, ministering to people, prison ministry. Um, and look, I've looked into the eyes of men who have do done some truly heinous things in order to be put in prison. And I was there, I watched as many of these men, not all of them, unfortunately, but many of these men gave their lives to Jesus Christ and became born again. And I saw a transformation occur in many of these men over time. And when, as a fellow sinner, of course, none of us are perfect, least of all me, but as a fellow sinner, I looked into these same eyes of these, some of these same men who had, again, done such terrible things in their lives, and I saw new life. I saw a new man, a new creation in each of these men. And I saw men on fire with love and passion and a zeal for Christ, that is unparalleled by anybody I have ever met out in the outside world, in the free world. Okay, I've, I've yet to meet anybody outside of prison who is as on fire as these guys, as passionate as these guys, as loving as some of these guys. It's, it's unbelievable to, to witness. And these men who are obviously incarcerated, <laughs> they feel freer than any of us in the outside because of the freedom that they found in Jesus Christ. And I, I saw firsthand what Jesus meant when he said to Simon that those who, that the, the one who loves his debtor the most is the one for whom the greatest debt was forgiven. But why were these men forgiven by Jesus? Why, why did they even feel the need for forgiveness? Because they were judged. Because they were just guilty in the court of law and given a sentence. They were judged by society and thus shunned by society because they had done something wrong, right? And there was no doubt in anybody's mind that these men were guilty. And these men who were sentenced knew that they were guilty. And they came to realize eventually by being made to confront the truth, the truth of what they had done and why it was wrong and why they deserved punishment, that they would ultimately be judged by God Almighty. That's why these men sought forgiveness. They understood that they were in need of forgiveness for many more sins than they had been put in prison for. And that they could be forgiven, but they, that they needed to repent. This is, this is an essential step, right? And they had to acknowledge their own sin, that it was wrong. And they had to ask Jesus to forgive their sins and wash them away. Repentance is a necessary step towards salvation, right? And it was only then that their new lives began, and they discovered a joy that they previously had thought impossible. And look, I loved these men in the prison. They were my brothers, these inmates. And they're still all my brothers, of course. And that's why I acknowledge that their past sins were wrong. I don't want them to end up back in prison once they get out of prison. And I certainly don't want that, them to end up in that eternal prison known as hell. So yes, I acknowledge that certain things that they have done were wrong. And I, and I would be more than willing to point out in the future when they're doing something that is wrong. So you better check yourself. If they had never been judged in any way, if, the, if it had never been acknowledged that they were guilty of some evil, it might, then they might never have felt the need for repentance, for penance, or, to, or the need to seek forgiveness and mercy from God. And that would inevitably result in them going to a place where I do not want them to go. I love them far too much to just let that happen. That is the step. Repentance. Repent! that is so often neglected by those who say, do not judge, full stop, right? They, they tell us not to judge as though we are somehow commanded by Jesus to be enablers of sin, and as if, we're not, as if we are not to minister to people, and as though we are to neglect the need for repentance. <laughs> no. Okay, Jesus told us not to judge unjustly or hypocritically. Yes, that's true. And he reminded us that we are all sinners, logs in our eyes and all of that, of course. And of course, 
ultimate judgment does belong to God. And that last part is the point. Okay? <laughs> They're ultimately going to be judged by God. They're going to be judged. That is the truth that is going to happen. <laughs> and if we neglect to share the truth with those who are guilty and we enable them in their sin rather than loving them enough to call out and admonish shameful behavior then and acknowledge the need for repentance, then they're going to be judged guilty by God and... Sadly, they're going to spend their eternity in the worst of possible prisons. Jesus did not say, do not judge, period, end of story, full stop. Okay, that's not what happened. Please read Matthew chapter 7 in its entirety, full context. Not just that one verse, not just those three words taken in isolation. That's not how you read the Bible. Okay, read, read the whole passage, and it's not that hard to find articles explaining what it really means. Okay, but... Anyhow, Jesus did not, did not say, do not judge, period, in a sentence. That did not happen. Okay, that would not only be incompatible with most every moral statement that Jesus ever made, but it would actually be an impossibility for us to live by. And I don't just mean that God's standards are, are impossibly high. I don't just mean in that sense. I mean, you have to make moral judgments. It's a necessity of existence. You judge that lying is wrong, that stealing is wrong, that murder is wrong, and... <laughs> I mean, you have a moral standard, and if I were to punch you in the face right now for no reason, you would judge that I was wrong, would you not? And not not just that, but every time that you tell me not to judge, you are actually making a moral judgment of me. You are judging that it is wrong of me to judge, you hypocrite. <sighs> Paul, in 1 Corinthians 5, actually tells the members of the Church of Corinth to shun the sexually immoral among them. He says, don't even have dinner with them until their behavior is corrected. Sounds rather judgmental, does it not? And yes, it does. But but these people who claimed to be followers of Jesus Christ needed to ha be confronted about their immoral behavior. This had to happen. And and this was an act of love. Don't, don't mistake it. I mean, if you truly love somebody, you want what is best for them, right? You don't want somebody you love to be addicted to heroin. Okay, you don't you don't want them to be living in squalor. You want what is best for them. You don't want somebody that you love to end up in the midst of a horrible sin or to destroy themselves or to, God forbid, end up in hell. If you truly love somebody, that's not what you want for them, okay? And you don't just let them do whatever they want. So confronting bad behavior is inherently an act of love. And if the immoral behavior did not cease in the context of 1 Corinthians, then these people were, be, were to be turned over to the devil, so Paul writes, so as to, in the hopes that they would hit rock bottom, and once they hit rock bottom, they would repent and come back. Because sometimes that's what it takes, right? Some hard-headed hard people sometimes have to hit rock bottom before they will come back, and hopefully they will. Making moral judgments is not only essential for a functioning society, but it is necessary for accountability. To be held accountable yourself, to hold other people accountable, okay? That behavior needs to be confronted. It has to. Not only for the good of the church or the good of society, but for the good of the confronted individual involved in the bad behavior. Do not judge is not a license to sin or to ignore or enable the sin of others. Jesus never advised us to simply let people do whatever they want no questions asked. He did not tell us to, to be mum on the, on the topic of sin and to just let people we love do anything they want. If we love them, we do not wish to watch them destroy themselves in their own sin. That's what love is. It wants the best for somebody. And we want them to repent and be forgiven and ultimately to be judged with mercy and enter the kingdom of heaven with Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for tuning in. On the off chance that you actually happen to like what you heard, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. It would really help me out. You can find me on YouTube, on Rumble, as well as on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you so much for your time, and God bless you.